to the point. Good evening. Does everybody have their ID cards from the ballot clerks? Thank you. We'll get going in a couple of minutes. We um, emergency announcement was just given. Next, if you would join me in a pledge of allegiance to the flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, uh, one thing we're going to take a little bit out of order is that uh, Bill Leslie, our usual clerk, is not with us tonight. He had a family emergency and had to leave. So Sue Caswell is, is uh, volunteered to be the clerk pro temp. Is there any issue with that? Any, all those in agreement, please raise your voter ID cards so it's all good. Okay, so Sue is going to take care of the clerk tonight for us. I'll give you a quick uh, introduction. My name is Richard Lawton. We've been living, uh, my family and I are here for a long time. Uh, personal privilege, my son, youngest son and his wife are living on Baghdad Road right out here now where my wife grew up. Uh, our grandson and soon to be granddaughter will be the fifth generation of uh, Shirley Thompson's family to go through the school district. So we're all very happy uh, to be here. If you don't know who Shirley was, ask somebody, they'll be glad to tell you. Okay. <laughs> and uh, with that, we're gonna start off with the Distinguished Service Awards before we get into the business uh, of the evening. And we have Michael Williams. Thank you. I, um, I have the pleasure of doing the most fun part of this evening's agenda. And this is particularly special to me as um, I am, our family is in our sixth year out of 10 in a row of having children at Moharmet. So uh, th this year's Distinguished Service Award goes to Holly Burt. Holly Burt's association with Moharmet and volunteering began 18 years ago and has never stopped. Holly began volunteering by reading in Ms. Chartrand's class, later gave spelling tests in Ms. Riley's class. 14 years ago, she began, began organizing and creating the school bulletin boards and nine years ago, she began supporting our Curriculum Enrichment Committee. Even though all of her children are out of Moharmet, Holly continues to volunteer and support our school. In 2019, it is easy to say that some of our most enduring traditions and enrichment experiences happen because of Ms. Burt. She is the organizing force behind our Curriculum Enrichment Committee, and along with Jim Davis, the organizer of our Maple Sugaring Season and Celebratory Pancake Breakfast. The Moharamut Enrichment Committee oversees Moharamut's annual enrichment theme, and since 1989, Moharamut has focused its enrichment activities on one school-wide theme. Topics have included years of the ocean, forest, artist, and diversity, among many others. Assemblies occur throughout the year, and an all-school day of event, all-school day of event is organized in the spring. These day of events have included trips to the ocean, a day at centers uh, at UNH and hikes in, in College Woods, a day of art across the Moharamut grounds, and a trip to the McAuliffe Shepherd Discovery Center. As a member of these committees, Holly organizes and brainstorms with faculty and staff, and then she gets things done. She connects with outside organizations, creates contacts, brings in speakers, presentations, and donations, if you work or live in our community, chances are pretty good that Ms. Burt has called you at some point to come teach, volunteer, or support the students of Moharamut. Teachers use these words to describe Holly. Encouraging, driven, supportive, creative, caring, resourceful, imaginative, and focused. Ms. Chartrand comments, I have been astounded throughout the years by Holly Burt's dedication to the children of Moharamut. Holly has worked to help make every Moharamut child's learning experience be filled with wonder. In her time volunteering with Moharamut, she has organized more than 50 assemblies, 10 pancake breakfasts, and the collection of more than 7,500 gallons of maple sap. <laughs> I didn't know we were counting that well, year by year. 
These events and activities are inspirational, creative, enriching, and educational. They have been pl created, planned, and executed by a dedicated team of Moharamut faculty and staff and a tireless, thoughtful, dynamic volunteer <coughs> named Holly Burt. Holly, please come up. Do you get your cell phone under control over there? <laughs> First the, the Patriots and now uh, this, this is a pretty good week. It's only, it's only Tuesday. Um, thank you seems very inadequate. Um, I'm not sure that there's anything I can say that would do justice to how everybody has made me feel at Moharamut. Thank you, Dr. Morse, Wendy, Catherine, Mr. Goldsmith, everyone who's put this together and especially for everyone who came out to support me tonight. I meet with the curriculum enrichment team almost every Thursday morning, and it's not hard with such a wonderful group of people. Not only are they wonderful people, but they are some of the most talented educators I've ever met. A treasured opportunity to work and learn from all of them. We collaborate and bounce creative ideas, all while valuing uh, what each other brings to the table. I truly love it. Bringing education to life for the students is not only my passion, but a goal for all of us in CE. My sincerest thanks to everyone on the team. Of course, there would not be a curriculum enrichment if there wasn't a Dennis Harrington. Dennis's superpower is believing in someone and trusting them. I am forever grateful for the opportunities you have given me. <coughs> David Goldsmith, it has been my pleasure to get to know you. Your ability to make other people feel comfortable and supported are recognized and very much appreciated. You are open to all ideas, crazy or not, and crazy tends to be my go-to, so I appreciate your patience. I have been privileged with the opportunity to collaborate and work on events at Moharamut for almost 4,000 children. Sparking a curiosity or helping to create a memory that they can carry with them would be a success. My fingers are crossed. At the end of the day, I think all I would like, and maybe all that any of us would like, is knowing that we, where we have been is a better place because we were there. So thank you for giving me that tonight. Okay, as we start the work of the evening, um, first of all, explain what we're going to do real quickly. We usually follow, follow Robert's rules of order uh, as best we can. If you have a question, please come up front, identify yourself, direct the question through me to whoever you would like to answer the question. We'll get you an answer. Try not to be repetitive. And everybody will get a chance to speak on it. Uh, hopefully before somebody else speaks twice, we'd like to have everybody have their first opportunity to speak on it. Next thing I have to do is I have to read the MS-26 default budget certification. It says that I certify that on January 25th, 2019, I posted the MS-26, the default budget and written warrant attested by the school board of the Oyster River Cooperative School District in the town of Durham at the Oyster River Middle School and the Oyster River High School, the place of meeting in the town of Lee at the Massway School, and the town of Madbury at the Moharamut School, signed by Wendy DeFuccio, and it's a notarized copy that I have here. Now, we'll start with the Warren articles. Coop Oyster River Cooperative School District, the state of New Hampshire 2019 school warrant. To the inhabitants of the Oyster River Cooperative School District of Durham, Lee, Madbury, qualified to vote on upon district affairs, you were hereby notified to meet at the Oyster River High School in said district on the fifth day of February 2019 at seven o'clock in the evening for session one of the annual school district meeting for the discussion of the articles three through four and any amendments thereto. Warrant articles whose wording is prescribed by law shall not be amended. No warrant article shall be amended to eliminate the subject matter of the warrant article at session one. 
the official ballot voting for school district officers, Articles 1 and 2, and, and on Articles 3 through 4 will occur at the town polling locations on Tuesday, March 12th, 2019. The town of Durham at the Oyster River High School, 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. The town of Lee, Lee Safety Complex, 7 a.m. <coughs> to 7 p.m. Town of Madbury, Madbury Town Hall, 11 a.m. to 7.30 p.m. On to the Warren Articles. Warren Article 1 will be to choose a moderator for the coming year. Warren Article 2 will be to, to choose two at-large school board members for the ensuing three years. Article 3 will be presented by Alan Howland, and then we will move on that article. kind of small, let me get it. All right, let's start out by reading it. This is my reading test. So this is as it'll appear on the ballot. Article three, shall the district raise and appropriate as an operating budget, not including appropriations by special warrant article and other appropriations voted separately, the amount set forth on the budget posted with a warrant or as amended by vote of the first session for the purposes set forth therein totaling $47,405,510. Uh, should this article be defeated, the operating budget should be $46,850,794, which is the default budget, which is the same as last year with certain adjustments required by previous actions of the district or by law, or the district may hold one special meeting in accordance with RSA 40 colon 13 comma 10 and 16 to take up the issue of the revised operating budget only. The board recommends this appropriation majority vote required. Please note, fund 10 equals $45,940,460, and that's the regular operating budget. Fund 21 is $824,050, and that's expenditures from food service revenues. Fund 22 is $600,000, and that's expenditures from federal and special revenues. And fund 23 equals 41,000, and that's expenditures for pass through funds. I move article three as written. Is there a second? Second. Second it over here. Explanation. All right. Okay, so when we start our budget process, which really occurs in May, uh, we don't really start off with the numbers, which we're gonna hit you with soon enough. What we really do is uh, we've been guided by a five-year strategic plan. And so the strategic plan, I mean, you may think that it's something that we stick up on the shelf, but it's actually a document that guides us, and it provides a roadmap of operations, and operations is our facilities, our food service, and our technology, and our academics. And so in May, we start to look where are we in the strategic plan and what are other things that are coming up. And so this year is unique because we've come to the end of our first strategic plan and we're adopting a new strategic plan. And how that works, so this is out of order, if you go up at the top, it says choose a site for a new middle school and develop design plans. Well, this has actually really been a five-year process. What we initially began to do is look at all of our schools and look at what were the capital needs of each of them. And when we started, there was a $4 million backlog on each of the schools, and so we've slowly been chipping away at each of the schools, but one school really stood out out, and that's the middle school. It is extremely old, and Jay will probably uh, laugh when I say this, but if I always was obsessed by looking at the top of the middle school, because each one of those big metal things, the air handlers, is about $200,000, and they all needed to be replaced. And so what we did is we put together a committee, and the committee then spent a year studying, is it economically feasible to renovate the high school, or should we look at having, or excuse me, middle school, or should we actually build a new one? And so what they came up with is no, it's actually not really economically viable to renovate. It's probably better to, to build a new one. And so that led to the next question, which is where would you put a new middle school? And so the committee looked at all the various properties throughout the district and tried to find the best site and of course, the best site that they came up with was the site that we have. And so, uh, in a minute, you'll hear more from them. As we move down, though, you'll see the next thing down here, which I think often gets lost in the dollars and, and cents, is what we're doing academically. And so, you'll see present uh, findings for the start time student survey, report the progress of both the middle school and the high school competency-based learning, 
report on the progress of the one-to-one -one technology in the middle school, provide feedback on the new high school schedule, and report world language at the middle school and possible expansion to the elementary. So the academic follows along similar to what we said operationally, and that is we start out collaboratively working with staff and administration and figuring out what programs are we going to try to implement how is the best way to implement them? Then the following year we looked at how did the implementation go and then we tried to make corrective course. And the reason we do this is that education is famous for implementing new programs, not following through and having them fail. So by doing it this way, what we're really doing is hoping to increase the probability of the success of our programs. With that said, I will pass this along to the middle school group. Good evening, everyone. I'm here with a great crew tonight. Um, thank you for coming out. Uh, my name is Jay Richard. I've been very fortunate and blessed to work in the school district for 20 years. Uh, my first five years was a, as a special education teacher, so this ADA issues is something near and dear to my heart. Uh, another exciting thing, when I went into administration 15 years ago, again, I've been principal for 10 years, I actually got to leave a room with no windows working with students with disabilities, and I finally got a window space. So that was kind of exciting uh, for me to get promoted to administration. Uh, in terms of ADA compliance, you can see some pictures up here. Uh, I also want to invite any community members any of you are always welcome to come to the middle school, set up an appointment with me, and I'd love to give you a tour of some of the challenges we face on a daily basis. Uh, some of the ADA challenges in terms of wheelchair lifts, uh, crowded hallways. A thing that happens quite frequently with middle school students is they get injured um, because they like to take risks or frequently have students on crutches. Currently, we have no students in the middle school that need a wheelchair, but in the near future, we will. Often, I would have parents with disabilities come to our open houses at night, and they say, Jay, this building is almost impossible for me to get around uh, due to some of my handicaps. So it's something that, um, you know, we hope at some point we get some of these things remedied. Um, we're a spotlight school, it's something actually we're very, very proud of, but in our most recent spotlight school visit, one of the things they cited is the many, many challenges of our programs in terms of their current spaces. Uh, so it's something, you know, we think about what is a spotlight school, we've been recognized as one of the um, exemplary middle schools in all of New England. There's only approximately 20 schools that have that designation, so it's something that we're very proud of. I'm going to turn it over to Bill Sullivan now to talk about some of the daily safety challenges we have in our school. <clears throat> Thanks, Jay. Uh, I'm Bill Sullivan. I'm the assistant principal. I've uh, been here in the district for quite a while, uh, 20 years at the middle school and eight in the office as Jay's assistant. Uh, I've seen a lot in the middle school over my years, and I'm going to change that slide. Uh, the safe, what I'm here to talk about today, though, is the safety issues really at the middle school with the current building we're in. And we have two areas that really concern us, and that's the front and the back. Uh, in the front, we have our drop-off and pickup of students. So on any given day, we've got... Uh, I'd you know, in the morning, sometimes up to 200 kids that are dropped off and all trying to get in the building, parents dropping them off, siblings dropping them off, trying to get to school. And it's a dangerous situation. Uh, Jay stands there in the mornings out front with a staff member or two and cringe sometimes to see as kids get out of their car, parents are looking over their shoulder to drive to make sure they're not hitting another car when the students are in front of their car. Uh, kids are coming around the backsides of cars. It's, it's a tricky situation. We've got cars coming up Code Drive, taking a right, uh, coming up Code Drive there, dropping their kids off, merging traffic there. It, it's a pretty uh, hairy situation. Uh, in the afternoons, it's even tougher as kids leaving the front of the school, going in all different directions. If you've ever been on Baghdad Road or Madbury Road around 310, 305, 315, 
Uh, traffic's backed up from the middle school all the way out onto those roads. Kids are getting picked up out there on those roads. Uh, traffic is stopped in both directions. Cars are trying to turn. Kids are going to the <coughs> library downtown. It's, it's, it's a scary situation sometimes. And thank goodness nothing's happened as far as we know where kids are getting injured or anything's happening to kids. But it's not a safe environment and it, it needs to be addressed. Uh, the other area of safety for me where I stay every day is out back and that's where I'm in our bus loop. Um, and you can see the, the photo if you've been to the back of the middle school, big huge piece of asphalt. And when we have recess every day and we like to get our kids outside, that's where they go. Uh, the problem with that is it's shared with in the morning with buses coming in, dropping kids off. In the afternoon we've got obviously the buses coming back to pick kids up. We've got, uh, it's a parking lot as well. I don't know if you can see it in the picture there, but our staff parks in that parking lot. So our kids are trying to have recess, get some fresh air exercise, having to maneuver around cars that are parked um, in a tough situation. Again, during the day, we've got delivery trucks coming in and out. We've got trash trucks coming to pick up trash during the day. Uh, today's a perfect example. I was out there, it was, you know, it was a beautiful day. Uh, at sixth grade lunch, we had every sixth grader outside today. So two, uh, 180 sixth graders approximately. We've got a fifth grade, thought it was nice. They'd take recess, so half the fifth grade was out there. And then we had an eighth grade science class. All of them out there in that area. And then I look up and I've got staff members coming back who have to leave and come and go because they're teaching out here, down here at the high school. So having to move kids and make sure it's a safe area is a tough spot. So. It, it's a situation that we're worrisome about. We look at it every day and cross our fingers. And again, nothing's happened yet, but hopefully it won't. Um, we've got Chris. I think Chris is. Oh, talk Jay's about, coming uh, up next. Just real quick, uh, some historical perspective on the middle school. There was originally part of it was built in the 1930s. Uh, I've actually spent some time when I talked about when I first became an assistant principal and I had my first window. That was in that part of the building. Uh, it also had some modifications or an addition in 1905. Uh, this was before my time, but I think they called that the old Oyster River Elementary School. Uh, we also had some modifications in the 1970s and the most recent modification or renovation was in the 1990s where we added a gym, moved some things around and essentially added four classrooms. Uh, one of the big challenges Jim Rosicki knows who's our facilities director, when we have issues or parts break at the middle school, an example would be our school library. Uh, we spent a couple months over a recent winter where we had no heat in the library. Of course, our staff are very good troopers, but we actually have to manufacture uh, the parts for these, some of these systems and heating systems actually have to be manufactured or fabricated, as Jim would say, because you can't go to FW Web or Home Depot to buy some of these parts. So it can be very challenging. We've also had similar issues with our school gym. A leader and I will speak a little bit tonight where we didn't have heat for quite some time and we have challenges getting parts and materials to remedy some of these situations. Um, Due to all the renovations, many of our windows and doors don't close properly throughout the school. So during the winter months, often we have to bolt our windows or screw our windows shut because we get concerned during storms that the windows will blow open. This has happened a couple of times where we've had a flooded art room. Uh, we came back from February break and there's a lot of water and that had to be fixed and retiled. So there's a lot of challenges that we have in terms of the current state of our building. Uh, I already mentioned that the heating systems on any given day, either our staff and students are very, very cold or very, very hot. Today was a beautiful day. Like Bill said, we forced all the kids to go outside for recess, but the controls on the heating systems can sometimes be a very challenge and some spaces were extremely hot today. Um, and, it, and it's again due to the size of the building and the old controls and challenges, it's, it's hard to make the climate appropriate for our staff and students. Um, I'm gonna turn it over to Chris now so he can talk about the academics in terms of the middle school. Hi, I'm Chris Hall, I'm a teacher at the middle school. And I wanna talk about spaces. We all know that some physical spaces really spark excitement for learning. Think of maybe being at the Diamond Library at UNH or maybe a cozy nook at your favorite bookstore. 
We also know there are spaces that distract us and detract from learning going on. I'm here just to talk briefly about some issues that our middle school has um, that negatively impact students' learning in, in academics. Jay mentioned the poor layout and the fact that the school was originally built in the 30s and then added onto four times. And what that results in is just a sprawling network of, of hallways. How that translates to academics is that it takes a significant amount of time to travel from one end of the building to the other. In fact, we timed it, it um, watched kids, and it takes 13 minutes, about a quarter of an hour, for kids to go from one end to the other and back. Um, and that's what eighth graders do every day when they go to PE and music. Um, and that cuts into teaching and learning time. That same poor layout results in hallway noise, which is a constant interruption. The fact that our um, specials are tacked on the end of the school effectively means that the entire school, about 670 students, get funneled to one end of the building past certain classrooms, mine and many others, <laughs> every day. Um, and that basically, that creates a bottleneck of, of hallway traffic, which is, is hugely disruptive. The poor layout also means that there's disruptive noise coming from classroom to classroom. For example, the music rooms, there's no buffer between the music rooms, say they're playing row, row, row your boat multiple times, or the Star Wars Death Star theme, <laughs> as the classroom next to them is trying to have star testing or silent reading. Um, and you know, they've got to play loud and proud, but you know, that, that's a challenge. Um, also, there's adjacent, um, some classrooms have um, register adjacent bathroom noise and the issues that come with that. Um, recess noise is another issue because um, as Bill was talking about the fact that the, the play area or the socializing area, the recess area is right outside on the hot top, half of the school's classrooms face that. So you can imagine in warmer weather when windows are open how distracting that is for literally half of the school. Last issue on the layout is the fact that um, the way that it works is some of our teams are physically separated even within grade level. For example, the fifth grade, half of the fifth grade teams are in one end of the building and half are in another end of the building. And what that means is it's a real challenge for uh, teachers to collaborate, both to share resources, but also more importantly, ideas. Um, and it, it really dilutes students' uh, sense of identity as a team. Jay mentioned the inefficient heating system um, and the old windows and the wild temperature extremes and how that impacts, well you can imagine how that impacts education, right? There are many classrooms, especially the third floor, they're in the 90s um, in you know, September and May and June. We, I think it was last week, Bill recorded um, a, a thermometer reading in the 30s inside right by the windows, those windows that are inefficient and don't properly close. You know, the middle of the classroom was maybe in the 50s. Um, and my, for instance, my classroom has to have the windows screwed shut every winter um, so they don't fly open. Um, what it means with the heating system is that some classrooms that are on the end of the line don't get much heat and kids, you know, might have to have a hat on, um, maybe some gloves. The rooms that are on the beginning of the line of heat get sort of a fire hose effect. And um, even in the coldest day in winter, kids are clamoring to open windows because it's so hot. So those are some of the challenges with, with the heating system. But probably one of the main issues is the inadequate class size that we have and the learning spaces that we have. Many of the rooms are just too small. In fact, when um, we had an original assessment done, 45% of our rooms were under the recommended classroom size. That's almost half of our rooms were under 900 square feet. Um, as you can see in some of the photos, students are jam-packed in and it really makes it hard to learn, especially with those larger seventh and eighth grade bodies. Some classrooms have been repurposed, but they don't, they don't it's not a, a good fit. For example, um, we have, you can see a photo with uh, a math student with his arm over an old sink because um, there's no other space. There are uh, stoves uh, from the old home ec life skills rooms that are now for a language class. Um, and there's a photo of a science room that uh, with no real science equipment. You know, there's no sinks, bunts and burners. So those are real challenges. Um, and lastly, really, we just need a better variety of, of quality spaces, spaces that match our middle school instruction and philosophy. For instance, we need small spaces for things like book groups and small group interventions. 
We don't have many of those. We need medium-sized spaces for things like when we want to meet as a whole team um, or a whole grade to build sort of neighborhoods within a school. And you need a large space that we currently don't have, a space that a whole school can gather to build school unity and um, pride. So to sum it up, our staff, I think, does a pretty amazing job of creating cutting edge opportunities for kids despite these challenges. <coughs> but imagine what could be done if, with a state of art facility, state of the art facility, one that would inspire learning and bring out the best in kids. I'm not sure who's going. <laughs> Good evening, everybody. My name is Andrea Von Oyen, and I'm the String Orchestra Director in the district um, for grades 5 through 12. The majority of my day is spent at the middle school each day. Um, I want to start out by saying that I've had the privilege of witnessing so much positive growth and um, change in the music department. The music staff, all of us are truly thankful for the support that's been shown to the program and to all of our students. In this district, in our middle school, we offer music to every single one of our middle school students, grades five through eight. And five years ago, added the string orchestra program, which is something that the majority of districts in New Hampshire actually don't offer. So due to the significant growth and just our large music program, we're now kind of experiencing the constraints of our building and teaching spaces more fully. I'd like to just take you through a little bit of um, about those constrictions from the point of view of the orchestra program, but also kind of more broadly shared by the music department. At the middle school, I teach all of the about 180 orchestra students in the cafeteria, which is a shared space that's both not acoustically sound or quiet at all. Everyday orchestra classes experience constant noise and foot traffic interruptions. These include people going in and out through the exterior doors to get to perhaps the dumpsters or students going outside for classroom activities and students just doing the normal cafeteria things like getting snacks or paying for their lunches. Teaching in the cafeteria also means having to set up and take down 30 to 50 chairs and music stands two to three times a day due to tables needing to be out for lunch and necessary cleanup time after meals, all things that are necessary in a school. It also means that when we have to reschedule as a music department, important rehearsals due to weather issues or unforeseen for circumstances, which we actually had to do last week for our fifth grade concert, it affects pretty much the rest of the school in a way that other teachers, including some of the people that are standing up here right now, their lessons, routines, and teaching spaces are also interrupted. In addition, due to lunch being in the cafeteria, again, as it should be, orchestra is taught in yet another shared space. So I go to the band room um, three classes per week, which involves kind of dragging all of my stuff for the students, instruments, books, and supplies to yet another part of the building, which kind of speaks to what Chris was talking about, about layout. It's also difficult to offer extra things to our students, which we always want to do. Um, extra after school help sessions or I run a before school chamber orchestra in the middle school but we can't really do this without intense noise interruptions from the large number of students that need to be in the cafeteria for various reasons. More broadly, a huge issue that the entire department deals with um, is something that Chris talked about as well, lack of storage space and classroom space. Our band rooms are simply not big enough for students alone, never mind having to store the hundreds of student instruments in those teaching spaces as well. Our chorus room is so small that students are crammed in and don't have the necessary space that they need to learn. All of our very sensitive orchestral instruments, which are all made of organic materials, are kept in locker rooms that are naturally not humidity controlled and sometimes temperature controlled. This causes them to arrive in many different states to class and requires teachers to spend precious instructional time making them playable. Just last week I spent 20 of my 40 minute class period fixing instruments so that students could play them during class. They come to um, class with bridges that have fallen over, with pegs that are out, they just aren't playable for our students. It's no doubt to me, and I think anybody in this room, that this district values the diverse programs that we offer our students. And I think the music department is one of these programs. The current music spaces just simply aren't 
the best conditions for our students to learn in, to keep their instruments in, and to make music in. They simply do not serve our students anymore. I can only imagine what our kids could accomplish in classrooms that gave them sufficient space to play and sing in, to, that gave our teachers the necessary room to teach, had acoustical conditions that were modern and up to date, had instruments that were stored in places that allowed them to be in working order, and had class time that was uninterrupted by constant noise and foot traffic. Our students work incredibly hard, and I believe their dedication truly warrants them learning environments to match. Thank you so much. Hello, everybody. My name is Alita Carter, and this is Emma Hewson. We're both PE teachers, and we'll both be presenting to you about our teaching spaces. Um, we are, will be talking about the gym, the multi-purpose room, our fields, the locker rooms, and our storage facilities. <laughs> Um, our space is very well utilized. We see over 330 students every day. Um, we have eight classes come to us with between 40 to 55 students at a time. Um, our space is also used after school by various programs, our sports and clubs, as well as different recreation and Oyster River um, ORYA programs as well. Although we love what we teach and we love where we teach, we would like to talk to you about some of our limitations with our spaces. Let's start with the gym. <laughs> so our gym can accommodate 24 moving students very well in every unit. However, um, we have 40 to 55 students come to us at a time. And to, to accommodate them, we also use a space called the multi-purpose room, um, but that space is a multi-purpose room. So it is used by the band or for school pictures or multiple things. And throughout the year, we'll have to move on anytime that it's needed. We're, we're very accommodating. We try to help everybody out in the building. So oftentimes when someone says, can we use the multi-purpose room? It's usually for a good reason. So we say yes. And that means that we have those 55 students in the gym, which is a small space for that amount of students to be moving in. Um, but the challenge with the multipurpose room is that it is a small space as well. So when we have the multipurpose room to use, 24 moving bodies is quite small. And to accommodate this, we choose activities that we can use in there, but oftentimes students do have to sit out for periods of time just to sub into activities to make it a safe space. The multipurpose room has cinder block walls that are not padded, and students are running around and being very active in that space, and so this space does create is a little bit worrisome for us in terms of safety. Um, one of the other things about the multi-purpose room that can be a challenge to us is that it is surrounded by two band rooms and one of our the walls is a movable wall. So you can imagine some of the same things that we've been hearing. We love our band so much. I don't want anybody to think that we don't. Um, we're super excited about our music program, but it is difficult to have two, um, two bands playing at the same time as us trying to explain how to hold a field hockey stick. <laughs> um, some other issues that we have, um, our spaces are our locker rooms. Um, currently, our locker rooms are being used for mostly storage. We do store those um, musical instruments and cellos, and again, they're probably not at the correct heat. Um, the problem with the locker rooms is that we don't use them for physical education um, for changing. Our class size, our class times are too, <coughs> too short to have kids change, but they are really needed for after school sports and activities, especially when there's cross country and track and there are like hundreds of kids participating in after school sports. You should go into the locker rooms and you'll see there are backpacks everywhere. Kids have nowhere to change. There's no single changing spaces for them. Um, and then there's so many things stored in there that it's, it's really probably, uh, our kids are so honest and it's great, you know, like nothing really gets disrupted, but at the same time, it's not a great place for other schools to come into to use that space. Um, today we had some basketball kids come from a, different, from a different school and they looked around and they were like, 
what is going on in here? They couldn't believe the space. They didn't know where to put their stuff. They couldn't get ready themselves. So it is an issue for, for other people. And that's kind of how they see us. They don't see us as like, we're ice server, we're the best. You know, they're like, oh, look at this space. It's a little embarrassing and it really doesn't show how awesome we are as waste river. Um, our other spaces that we're gonna, I'll just talk about real quick is um, that our office spaces that are the PE staff office spaces are in the locker rooms, which makes it really hard for students to get in touch with us. Um, and any staff member, uh, you can imagine it's a little uncomfortable anytime Jay needs to see me if I'm not in the gym or if he needs to see Emma, he'll scream through the locker room, which, you know, there's a girl's bathroom there and you have to go through another door. He'll say, are you in there? And it's extreme. I can't imagine how uncomfortable that must make him feel. And we're like, yeah, be right out. And, you know, this is how people have to find us unless we're in the gym or the multipurpose room, which we usually are. Um, Again, we love, we love where we are and we make things work and when we have to have 55 kids in the gym, it's not optimal for us, but, um, but we would love to see something more than that. But Emma's gonna talk a little bit more about our field space and some of our storage issues. Hi. Um, this fall highlighted the struggles we had with our field and its drainage issues. We try to spend as much time outside during the warmer months um, that we can, but when it rains, we have to stay inside. The field unfortunately holds moisture and stays wet with standing water long after the rain has passed. This becomes a safety issue for kids because the grass becomes slippery. And at times we have used the blacktop, however the proximity to the classroom windows creates a noise disturbance for classes. This fall we had so much rain that created large puddles of standing water, we lost a lot of outdoor time. Our units for outside could not be moved inside due to the constraints <coughs> that Alita highlighted earlier and our fall curriculum needed to be changed for the year. The storage closet attached to the gym is extremely small and we have struggled to find cost effective solutions for, the sh for shelving. Our current shelves have not held up due to the weight of our equipment. Recently the gym floor cleaning machine needed a place to be stored and it's also now stored in the gym storage closet. The multi-purpose room has a storage uh, closet that uh, there is a picture of it up there on that slide. Um, we share it with music, athletic teams, folding tables and two rolling racks of chairs. Our base is in a loft above the chairs and can only be accessed by a ladder, which requires removing the chair rack um, so that we can open the ladder, and then climbing up to get up top. Since the locker room shifted from a changing area to a storage location, we've put some storage in there as well. Accessing these takes preparation and time due to the gender specific areas and the location of the locker rooms being down the hall from the gym. No, a couple people have mentioned the heat, but the heat has had some trouble in the gym as well. Uh, some days it's been as cool as 58 degrees, other days it can reach close to 80. Um, in addition to that, the air exchange that's pumping the heat through, um, it's extremely loud. It's very difficult for students to hear us give directions across the gym, which results in more class transitions and less activity time. The lighting in the gym is very dim. There hasn't been any natural light because there aren't any windows. And this creates a less inviting environment and makes us very thankful for we, when we can get outside in the nice dry weather. Both the locker rooms and the gym have had some water leakages over the years. We've grown accustomed to trash cans spread out in our office and locker rooms to collect any dripping water. To conclude, we would love to see adequate light in the gym and a space to implement the program over our dreams. This would include more student choice, multiple safe spaces to play and engage cooperatively with peers and equipment that is easily accessible for our program needs. Thank you. Good evening, my name is Michelle Pinelli and I'm here to address some of the building challenges we have in the World Language Department. With the support of the community, the school board and the ORMS staff, we've been able to expand our World Language program during the past couple of years at the middle school. We used to be a department of three servicing seventh and eighth grade in French and Spanish and now we are um, servicing three grade levels in French, <coughs> Spanish, and Chinese. And with that, we now have expanded our staff to six staff members, including two Chinese teachers who are provided by the Confucius Institute. Um, and now we're quickly outgrowing our space. We still only have three designated world language classes, um, and so this poses a huge challenge for us. 
We're maximizing the current use of our language classes, but there are times where we are all teaching, and so we have to go into shared spaces um, in other parts of the building. Currently, we're sharing a classroom with an eighth grade math teacher for one of our Chinese classes. We are also using the life skills room for a couple of French classes and a couple of Chinese classes. And finally, our smaller Chinese classes are um, being hosted in the kitchenette area, which is a very small little nook um, behind the library. Um, when, the life skills when the life skills room is needed for cooking classes, we then need to look for other um, rooms to secure um, in order to be able to hold our classes for language. Um, and as you can imagine, you can see up on, the, up on the screen, these classrooms are still fully functioning kitchenettes and kitchen areas, which as Chris had mentioned earlier, creates a lot of distraction for our classes. Um, we also have space issues within all of the classrooms. The Chinese classes are already um, starting to outgrow the kitchenette area. So next year we will not have that area available. It's just gonna be too small for the incoming classes. In our other classrooms, as you can see some, from some of the photos, we have sinks in there with um, exposed pipes. One of the classrooms is actually an old uh, science room still with all the um, intact countertops. So it makes it very challenging for us to be able to fit appropriate furniture in the rooms, especially in the life skills room and in the kitchenette, in order to um, hold our classes and also be able to do, um, conduct interactive and communicative immersion classes. Um, so as you can see, this is not the ideal um, situation for us. We're really hoping that with community support, we will be able to get the classroom space that is appropriate um, for the future needs of our students and for the District World Language Program. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. And just to close real quick, uh, one of the my most eye-opening things was, and I wanna emphasize, uh, having worked at the middle school for 20 years, this is the place we work. This is where my staff and I pride, on, pride ourselves on giving our kids great learning experiences. Our, our students are excellent and very resilient. They don't uh, complain about having recess and, uh, on, on the pavement because that's all they know. But uh, last spring, I was fortunate. I toured, uh, I think, three different schools, fairly new middle schools. So it was very eye-opening to me what, what things could possibly be for our staff and students in a, in a new school. Thanks again for your time tonight. And I want to emphasize if anyone out there or even watching wants to come check out the middle school firsthand, you can just contact me, jrichard or csd.org. Anytime during the day or any night, I'd be glad to show you around. Thank you. thank the middle school staff for doing the presentation. They've done a really detailed job of explaining the, the handicaps they face on a daily basis with the current school. So the next logical piece is to talk about um, what we could have if we had a new school. So all of this ties into Warrant 3 um, because in, in our budget we have set aside $800,000 for pre-construction work. Uh, related to the new middle school in order for us to be able to have a much more detailed explanation at our next deliberative session next year. So we're on a 12-month window to bring work forward for your consideration a year from now about the possibility of building a new middle school. I want to introduce Ron LaValle. Uh, he's the architect of record for, uh, for the school system and he's been uh, doing a lot of visioning work and getting a handle on who we are as a school system, what our needs are. Ron? Do I just hit enter to change the slides? Yeah. Okay. There we go. Hi, and thank you very much um, for allowing me to speak. My name's Ron Lamar. Um, I have been working um, closely with the school board uh, with Dr. Morse and the educators to really come up with a vision um, for what it is a new middle school can do 
for the school district. Um, one of the big guiding principles that came out of those visioning sessions, which some of you may have heard of, um, we had students come and talk with us, parents come and talk with us, community members, as well as the educators. And everybody talked about a sustainable building. And so one of the visionary things that we would talk about in a new school is what does sustainability mean? So the first thing is operational cost. I think everybody talked about having a building that would sustain itself and drive down operational costs um, for the district. Have a building, um, this, this is a very simple diagram you're looking at on how buildings today actually live and breathe. Um, and if we do this right, in fact, take advantage of um, the idea of building a new school, you can get indoor air quality and energy efficiencies all rolled up into one with materials and systems that actually last for quite a long time um, that are very easy to clean so there's no chemicals in the building. It's um, very durable. And as someone said a, little minute, a few minutes ago, how inspiring these educational spaces can be. And so essentially sustainability means taking a look at it from not only the education piece of it, but the safety and the security all the way through to the durability and the operational costs of the building. And that would be goal number one, if you will. Um, the timeline that we're looking at right now is obviously March 2019. We would start working in earnest with the educators again, with the students again, and with all three communities to really take a look at developing the building. What you see here tonight is just a couple of concept sketches in terms of how a new building would sit on the site. But this concept really needs to be refined to be turned into a schematic design and a developed design, um, working with the construction manager to actually price this um, and bring it in front of the voters next year. So there's about a year's worth of work that we're talking about doing. Our goal would be to finish schematic design in May so before everybody leaves for the summer, um, they really have a good idea of what, what, about what this building could be, um, from what it'll look like to how it's organized inside the building, and to talk about um, or to address everything that was just talked about, from the music programs to world languages to physical education, science, art, um, the core curriculum. And then what we would do is in November come back um, to everyone and talk about a guaranteed maximum price for the project. And that would be put on the ballot um, in March of 2020. <coughs> the goal is to not only do this work this year, but also bring the project along to the point so that after a successful vote in March of 2020, construction would actually be able to start in May of 2020. So we would get site work started and we would get the foundations and steel started early, if you will, on a fast track basis, which would allow the students um, to get into the building quicker, obviously. And so what that means is to actually move into the new school in March of 2022. So everybody would go on their spring break, um, come back um, in 20 of 22, and then the site work demolishing the old building and doing the site work out front would be done so that in September 2022, it's a whole new facility um, on the site. This is just an image um, in terms of what that means. You can see that the old building, the middle school, the current middle school is kind of ghosted on the property right there. The idea is to build the new building behind, um, between where the wetlands are and the school <coughs> itself. And what you'll see on this slide is a bunch of dashed lines because we're working with traffic engineers and civil engineers and experts in the field to address what Jay talked about a little earlier when it comes to safety um, of the students, um, the vehicular paths around the building, the pedestrian paths around the building, and actually trying to separate them, um, get it a little bit more organized so when parents drop off and buses drop off, it's a lot safer for the students. Um, and that is essentially uh, going to take place, obviously, right after the vote this year, is to really start digging into this and figuring all this out. So the question is, now that you've heard that there's a need for the middle school or need to move forward to, to do the schematics for the middle school, 
how does that fit into the 2019-2020 budget? And so as I said, in May, we begin to think about where we're going. In the fall, we actually put together the numbers and think what actually is our budgetary goal. And nothing has been more hotly debated than the semantics of our budgetary goal. So I, uh, Michael Williams said to me, "How make it numerical, I like numbers. So I, I tried to do that. So the budget goal, what we're really saying is that the net spending increase of the 2020 budget uh, from the 2019 budget and this year is unusual, will be a range between 3.25% and 3.75%. That's unusual because normally we pick a solid number. I think we were, because of the, uh, the facilities construction work that was gonna go on, we had great uh, uncertainty about our ability to make the budgetary goal. And so how does that work mathematically? Well, when you look at the increase that's occurring, it's $1,663,818, and that represents a 3.75% increase. You can scratch off the width of 3.49% impact because that's we're not there yet. Revenue we use to offset that, and this is similar to how a municipal budget works, for example, in Durham, we offset our spending increase with revenue. And so in this case, the increase in revenue is $302,700. And so when you offset the, the uh, spending increase with the revenue, the new spending uh, budget is $1.3,661,118. And so that really splits uh, the two uh, extremes of our goal, and it comes in at 3.49% net increase. Oops. I guess I, I should do the masked way I hear as it's thrown in here. So uh, you already threw uh, $800,000 was thrown in for the uh, site work for the uh, middle school or the schematics for the middle school. The other issue that we have is the entryways of the elementary. Uh, the first one we attacked last year in the budget, which was masked way. And of course, school safety has become paramount. And so restructuring the front of the Mastway school uh, so that we could see who was coming in and they were in a vestibule so they didn't have access to the school uh, by just walking in was the front part. Additionally, we added three classrooms and a music room. Uh, there had never been a music room at Mastway. It had always been kind of an ad hoc thing that we did off of the gym. And so, that brings us to Moharamet. We have the same problem with Moharamet. Moharamet right now, if you, while we do have cameras and that, that we look at the front and see who's coming in, once you're buzzed in, you have access to the entire school, which is unacceptable. And so the new project really with Mass or Moharamet is again, to do what we did at Mast Way, which is uh, redoing the front entryway of the school. It allows, uh, to see who's coming in, it also has a vestibule, so it doesn't allow access to the entire school. And you can see here's like their fancy drawings I'll show. I think there's a, a better picture over there so you can get a, get a, a good idea of it. Which brings me to the money part. So any budget that a school comes up with, the majority of the budget is gonna be staffing. And so when you look at the drivers that are driving the, the 2020 budget, the first one Dan is gonna talk about in the next Warren article, which is a, a negotiated agreement with ARESPA, which is our custodians and our secretarial staff. The thing that everybody worries about is health uh, insurance. Uh, we have a uh, maximum of 5.7% increase. This year what we've really looked at, I mean you hear a lot about student wellness, but we're actually looking at staff wellness. And that is a, a healthy teacher is more likely to be an effective teacher. And additionally it controls our healthcare costs. And so we've begun to implement a program of our wellness uh, uh, cycle to try to address staff wellness. And then of course, there's the two construction projects I just talked about, $800,000 for the middle school, 755,320 for the Meharmet front entryway. And then something we talked about as we got deeper into the budget cycle, which is staffing. And normally we put uh, additional staffing is sitting at the very back of a book and we debate it. And so, um, you may have heard uh, a lot about the rise in mental, concern of mental health in adolescents and, and school age kids. And so when we looked at the high school uh, counseling, it was the, the, uh, the workloads or caseloads are way above the state average. And so it's not just about 
do, you, do I take English one or English two? It's addressing more of the issues that are happening with kids. And if our caseloads are that high, we can't effectively implement programs to help them. The other one we added was at the elementary, uh, adding an elementary special ed director. We had had the position before, but we cut it. And this allows us to have someone to coordinate the care of both Mastway and Moharamet. Uh, what we found is that the needs of kids coming into our school are, are increasing and so therefore it's, it's driven us to do a staff increase. And so that totals $206,000. The final thing which is the largest is we're in the third year of the guild contract which is $587,169. Okay, so it's not quite as simple as doing a town budget when you have a cooperative school district. A town budget, for example, a Durham budget, the entire impact of the budget goes to Durham and is divided among the residents based on the value of your house. Here, uh, we have three different communities are coming together, so the question is, how do we divide the budget up between those three different communities? And that's the, the apportionment formula. And so the apportionment formula, the way it's calculated, is we take the average daily attendance of students from each town, and we also then take the equalized value of your property in your town. Each of those count half, and that then develops how much of the pie that your town pays. And so it's kind of a small print, but if you look at this, we put up uh, fiscal 19 and fiscal 20, and you'll see that over that time, Durham had a slight decrease in the amount of the total pie that it was, it was picking up. So it's about 53.4%. When you look at Lee, that really should catch your attention. Uh, what happened is it went from slightly over uh, uh, 30 to 31, so it's about a 3.15% increase. And when you look at Madbury, it was a, a decrease of almost 3%. And so the total dollars means that Durham picks up 18.3, Lee picks up uh, 9.4 million, and Madbury picks up 4 million, call it eight. So the question is, why did Lee jump so high? And if we look at it, you'll see that I've put up the change in the average daily number of students and the change in the equalized value of your properties. And so Durham had a slight decrease in students, Lee had a slight increase in students, and Madbury had the largest decrease in students. But re what really stands out is the change in the equalized value of your property. So Durham, it was almost 6%. Lee was 12% and Madbury was 6.1%. And what that, and actually to add insult to injury, I did the last thing which is the net apportionment change. And that is we take the, the total increase minus what you get in aid from the state. Each town gets a different number. Uh, and so when we did that, you'll see that Durham, the change is 590,000. Uh, Lee, it's 775,000. Not only did you have an increase in the number of students and an increase in your equalized value, you also had a decrease in uh, the amount of money that you got from the state. And Madbury finally had 103,375,000. ,103 so again, it's a combination of increasing students, equalized value, and decline in aid from the state that really have made it difficult for Lee. So what does that mean in terms of like the tax impact for you? And of course, this is always an estimate. We're unsure, we're giving you our best guess. So for Durham, it's 52 cents per thousand, which represents about a 3.04% change. Lee is a $1.91 per thousand, which is 8.88%. And Madbury is a slight decline uh, of less than a percent, or uh, excuse me, uh, 20 cents per thousand, which is 0.89%. Uh, and so again, the difficulty really is uh, while we can control our costs and have a budget uh, goal of coming in around 3.5%, the external factors, which is the equalization uh, value of your property, as well as your student uh, numbers, make it very, very difficult to control the actual tax impact on your town. Questions? So, on Warren Article 3 and the presentation. Are there any questions on Warren Article 3 as it's presented? There are none as Warren Article 3 is presented. I would ask everybody who agrees with Warren Article 3 as presented, raise your voter ID cards. Those opposed, 
And the warrant article is accepted as written. It'll be on the ballot as written. The next will be warrant article four, presented by Dan Klein. Okay, good evening everyone. Warrant Article 4 reads as follows. <clears throat> Shall the district vote to approve within the provisions of New Hampshire RSA 273-A colon 3, the cost items included in the collective bar bargaining agreement <coughs> reached between the Oyster River Educational Support Personnel Association and the Oyster River School Board, which calls for the following increases in salaries and benefits at the current staffing levels. 2019 20, $41,378. Uh, 2020-21, $45,532. 2021-22, $48,809. And further to raise and appropriate the sum of $41,378 for the 2019-20 fiscal year, such sum representing the additional costs attributable to the increases in salaries and benefits required by the new agreement over those that would be paid at current staffing levels. Levels? There's a question mark, sorry. Um, the school board recommends this appropriation majority vote required. Uh, I move warrant article four as written. It has been moved, is there a second? Second. Thank you. Okay. Um, warrant Article 4 uh, breaks down this way. Uh, ARESPA, the Oyster River Educational Support Personnel Association, uh, is a collective bargaining unit that covers all of our custodians and administrative support personnel. Uh, we negotiated a new three-year contract with them uh, for the years mentioned in the article. Um, some of the highlights uh, that were addressed in the new contract are um, the addition of new health and safety language, um, uh, worth mentioning representation on the uh, district's health safety committee uh, for this group, clarifying language added to employment status for school year secretaries and administrative assistants. Um, this language differentiated between those who work a calendar year versus a school year. Um, a pro established a probationary, or changed, I should say, the probationary period from 30 days to 90 days. This is just standard and consistent with other contracts. Um, add a clarifying language for overtime and personnel time. Add a clarifying language for sick bank leave. Uh, established a yearly clothing and uniform reimbursement of $100 to custodians. And the cost of living in allowance increase uh, breaks down as follows. Year one, 3%, year two, 3.2, year three, 3.3. .3. Um, and then the impact of the proposed ARESPA contract uh, over the three year term breaks down as follows. For 2019-20, or 3%. Um, 2021, 45,532 or 3.2% and 2021-22, $48,809 or 3.3%. And lastly, the overall budget impact, um, the addition of the 41,378 brings the total with warrant articles to 45,981,838. Uh, for a total increase of 3.75%, and then minus projected revenues brings that to 3.49%. Question. You've heard Warrant Article 4. It's been moved, seconded. Explanations or any discussion on Warrant Article 4? <coughs> there being none, those that accept Warrant Article 4 as written, please raise your ID cards. Those opposed? Thank you. I don't believe there's any further business coming before us. I'm waiting for my friend to work his way down front. Oh. While he does that, I will tell you that the official ballot voting for the school district officers, articles one and two, articles three through four will be Tuesday, March 12, 2009, Town of Durham, Oyster River High School, 7 a.m., 7 p.m., Town of Lee, Lee Safety Complex, 7 a.m. to 7 p.m., Town of Madbury, Madbury Town Hall, 
11 a.m. to 7.30 p.m. Yes, Mr. Parson. John Parsons, Durham. I actually have two things to Absolutely. say this evening, but they'll be brief, Mr. Morse. First, I want to thank the school board and administration for moving on the middle school issue. It's, um, it's well past time to do something with that building, something constructive with that building, no pun intended, um, because it has various issues, and which brings me to thanking the there they are, middle school staff members who gave up some time this evening to come and describe the various issues there that, that need to be taken care of. And secondly, in, in memory of Pete Steer, I'd like to move we adjourn. Thank you. There's a motion to adjourn. Is there a second? <coughs> second. <laughs> There's a second. We'll see everybody on March 12th at the poll. Thank you very much.